in Sahara, a topic I've been working on uh, for many, many years. So uh, as you probably know, all of you, this conflict is entering its 44th year with no resolution in sight. Um, you know, the, the evolution of this conflict has gone, you know, from many stages, from a United Nations decolonization process to a virtual annexation by, by a new colonial power. You know, the, um, I know Pedro is in the audience. Uh, he would probably give you some of the uh, similarities with East Timor, you know, which was colonized and then recolonized by uh, another power, but uh, the, which one which had uh, a good ending since uh, East Timor uh, got its independence. So what I would do uh, is to give you uh, a few basic facts for those who may not be uh, familiar with the with the topic, because this will uh, allow us to understand uh, how much uh, the uh, you know the resolution of this conflict has been derailed uh, from its uh, track. Um, my talk is not about the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict, but to point out some of the patterns in Western Sahara, especially in the policy of, uh, you know, Morocco vis-a-vis -vis, uh, this conflict. I would argue that it mirrors uh, the ones that had occurred in the evolution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. The major difference uh, for, you know, that one can point out at the onset is that the Palestinian-Israeli conflict gets much more attention than the conflict in Western Sahara. And, you know, this is why, you know, some uh, people uh, argue that it is a, uh, a frozen uh, conflict or, uh, you know, uh, which I will come back to uh, in the Q&A. Um, the idea of the, the, this uh, parallel that I draw between the two came to me from a, an Israeli scholar, uh, a specialist who has published uh, tremendously on the uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And, and he asked me, he said, you know, I never understood why, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the Arabs always focus uh, on us, that is the Israelis, uh, and never mention Morocco's occupation of Western Sahara. And he told me that he will ask uh, some of his uh, graduate students to write their thesis on the topic. So this was, my first, you know, it, it, it just occurred to me. My quick answer to that is, of course, that if you look at the Arab world, yes, it is attached to the, um, in various degrees, to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, but uh, uh, by, by and large, uh, it ignores totally uh, the Western Sahara issue. Uh, it's not uh, in, on the, it's never been on the agenda of the Arab League. And, you know, and uh, most Arab countries uh, are aligned with Morocco's position, not because uh, of its worth or because, you know, it's a right uh, cause or anything, uh, but for different geopolitical interests or like, you know, Mubarak used to say, we don't need another conflict in the Arab world. So because you don't need another conflict in the Arab world, you totally, uh, you know, ignore the right uh, of, the, uh, of the Sahrawis. Um, what I would like to also uh, start with is that, you know, uh, many uh, don't believe that Western Sahara is a rich state for a long time. You know, people would say, oh, it's a piece of desert. Why is it that people are fighting over it? Well, uh, this is, of course, totally wrong because it's a very rich uh, territory. Uh, you know, it has uh, some of the richest fishing waters in the world. Um, which, by the way, you know, these are waters that have been, uh, the fisheries have been exploited illegally, you know, not only by Morocco, by, by uh, Europe, the European Union uh, as well. Some of you may have been present last week when uh, Miriam, uh, Miriam Naily uh, had spoken uh, about this, the, the resources in Western Sahara, but it's worth mentioning in the uh, discussion tonight. Um, so, it, and it's not only the fisheries, you know, probably that it's also rich in phosphates, uh, other uh, valuable uh, minerals such as iron ore, titanium uh, oxide, uh, vanadium, iron, and possibly oil. 
which are abundant in in the territory. So so there's th this is uh, just a basic fact. Another uh, some other uh, basic political facts is that the conflict is still uh, in many ways a remnant uh, of the Cold War and of alignments. Uh, Morocco being anchored in uh, the Western camp and played a proxy role uh, against nationalist and communist movements during the Cold War, uh, and it has benefited from strong political, economic, and military support from its Western allies, uh, as well as the Gulf monarchies, uh, you know, uh, from the beginning uh, of the conflict. So, so um, this is, this is, uh, some of um, you know a basic uh, political point, but also that uh, in many ways the the Western powers are you know were behind uh, the seizure uh, of the uh, of the territory uh, you know and so uh, the rest as we I would try to show is um, simply talk processes uh, but the uh, the real goal is to maintain. Uh, Morocco's uh, occupation. Um, the legal facts, and there are people who are better than me in, uh, you know, international law. But uh, ba the basic fact is that self-determination of Western Sahara, uh, which is a non-autonomous uh, uh, territory, uh, rests on international law and UN resolutions. These are uh, internationally agreed upon. Uh, you know, principles. The right to self-determination is inscribed in the Declaration of the Granting of Independence of Colonial Countries and Peoples. This was in the General Assembly Resolution 1514, uh, 15 of uh, December 14, 1960. And since uh, 1963, you know, the um, the United Nations uh, had recognized uh, the Sahrawi's right to self-determination and has restated that right uh, in every re resolution since. Uh, and so, so I, basically, as a researcher, you, know, you start asking the question, why has the conflict never been resolved despite the existence of the UN mission for the referendum on Western Sahara? You know, this is a, 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 this a mission was set up in 1991 you know, for a self-determination process, for a uh, you know, for for the Sahrawis to choose uh, for the future whether they want to be integrated to Morocco for independence. I mean, initially it's just independence; it's not you know anything else. The other question I ask myself: What does Morocco continue uh, its occupation? A word that it has uh, progressively, uh, I mean, it has projected, uh, even if it appeared. In UN documents, Miriam uh, mentioned last week that uh, you know uh, it doesn't appear in the documents and it hasn't in recent years. But that does not neglect the fact that it is part of the UN documents and it is uh, an occupation. So, um, so that was that was my second question. Uh, and why is it that the Moroccans have reneged on the holding of a referendum? Uh, because King Hassan the Second. In 19, 1981 and 1983, you know, said that he was favorable to the holding of a referendum. I didn't believe him at that time, anyway, but he did state it. Um, and also, why did it renege on the, uh, the United Nations settlement plan of 1991, which included the holding of a referendum without any, you know, and why is it that Morocco has reneged on this? without consequences. Some of you in the room are saying, okay, that's probably reminiscent of what Israel has done all along. That is, you know, uh, reneging on many of the resolutions uh, while going unpunished. So it, it would take a long time for me to answer uh, all these questions, but um, I can just make some statements which I will be more than happy to elaborate on during the Q&A. Uh, one of which is that Morocco has never had any intention of holding a referendum. This has been my position, my, argu uh, my argument for a long time in my writings. Uh, its policies have always been to obtain what Hassan II said, that is obtaining the blessing of the United Nations for the annexation 
of the territory. And so, and like Israel, it has advanced historical claims. Uh, that is one of the other uh, points that are of similarity. So, so it has done, uh, Morocco has used different approaches to circumvent UN resolutions, disputing the border's eligibility, that was throughout the, 19, the early 1990s, uh, or, you know, accusing, uh, you know, using as a scarecrow, uh, Polisario as being an Islamist movement that they did uh, in the, uh, well, in the 70s first as a communist movement, uh, in the 80s uh, as well, and then it turned uh, to uh, an Islamist movement and then to a terrorist movement link linked to Al-Qaeda. So these are some of the arguments that you would hear from uh, officials, although this has been uh, refuted even by uh, the United States uh, administration. Um, so, so clearly no one believes that, but this is meant to discredit the, uh, the movement. In 2007, and here, is, uh, you know, it's something that uh, students of, uh, of uh, conflict should, you know, would, would, would acknowledge is that um, Morocco, it's not Morocco alone that came up with the idea uh, of autonomy. This idea came from the French, it came really in the past from Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, uh, you know, was opposed totally uh, to uh, a settlement. So, so basically, you know, when 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 the process was stalling, uh, you know, they came up with this idea of autonomy, which, by the way, uh, has never I challenge anyone to show that there was something really called autonomy, that it has any substance, anything to discuss. In fact, whenever the uh, the Sahrawis, uh, the, the representatives of the Sahrawi people, the Polisario met uh, with, um, you know, with the, with the Moroccans, you know, whether it was in an Assent or elsewhere, you know, they would sit down and if the Mor the Sahrawis asked, okay, talk to us about the, what is this autonomy, the Moroccans would refuse. What did I mean by Israelization of the Western Sahara conflict? It, it's simply that Morocco's aims are to impose situation of the facto occupation and continues you know through uh, a settlers colonization process to eventually where there would be uh, you know it's, it's such a situation on the ground that there is almost no way of getting into a solution it would be quasi impossible so it's you know and, and the other thing that that struck my mind is that this process or what I call Israelization is that you ensure that occupation is somehow accepted by the international community. You know, the international community would feel so helpless or, you know, they say, well, it's business as usual. What can you do? And it continues. And at the same time, you, you are proceeding, you know, building more settlements or, you know, uh, like the Moroccans have done, you know, since the 1980s, you know, of building, uh, you know, for for the settlers coming from uh, from the north and so on, and marginalizing uh, the Sahrawis, uh, Sahrawi, uh, the, the 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 real the indigenous people, you know, uh, in their own country. So um, so the, the but again, uh, one of one argument I would uh, I would put forth is that. This would not have happened, just like with, with, with Israel, without the United States, a lot of the things that happened on the ground would not happen. In the case of Western Sahara, it is France, and that will be another part of my talk uh, this evening, because I would argue that without France's support, Morocco would not have gone uh, unpunished in, uh, in Western Sahara. So, so France defense, uh, in, in, in a sense, the moment the process was taken away from the hands of the African Union to uh, the United Nations uh, as such, uh, you know, that was basically uh, the moment when France was in charge uh, of the file, of the Western Sahara file, and nothing would happen without uh, France. I'll give you just a quick example. For those of you who are familiar, it's no surprise, uh, you know, uh, in 2003, for instance, when James Baker almost achieved 
a, 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 an acceptable solution, which by the way, both uh, the Sahrawis and the Algerians uh, accepted the resolution, the, the plan, uh, Baker plan two, uh, France uh, threatened uh, to veto the, 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 the resolution. And of course, the United States, which had pushed for it, you know, uh, basically backed down because of what was going on in, uh, uh, in Iraq and, and so on and so forth. So France, but by the way, is in charge in, you know, whenever there is a resolution, France would uh, prevent the inclusion of a human rights uh, mandate, uh, you know, uh, for, for the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the mission, which is basically the only peacekeeping mission that doesn't have a, uh, a, a human rights mandate. My, my colleague and friend, uh, Stephen Zunas, I don't know if he's uh, uh, listening, uh, he asked one time, and uh, you know that that's another article that um, you know pushed me to think in those terms of uh, Israelization. Uh, he wrote a, an, an article uh, in U.S. Foreign Policy in Focus, uh, U, U, uh, Foreign Policy in Focus, uh, which is why why does Washington you know maintain such support for Israel? You know it, it, why. Uh, you know, because it had maintained a large-scale military, financial, diplomatic support for the Israeli occupation, you know, even in the face of uh, unprecedented violations of international law and human rights standards by the Israeli occupation forces. I was quoting here, by the way. So, so this leads me to answer the same question regarding uh, France's support for Morocco, despite the illegality of the Moroccan occupation and the violations of human rights, the legitimate rights of the Sahrawis. I would submit to you that what has prevented the resolution of the conflict is, in a society, just like in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, is the contradiction between legality, international legality, and power politics. You know, um, so so you know. Stephen Zunas and myself, when we started, uh, you know, dealing with the Western Sahara, we were focusing on this decolonization process, how it was going to happen, what, you know, uh, UN resolutions and this and that and this and that. And then you get, I guess you get a little bit more mature. And then you realize that the games that powers, you know, outside powers play are the main impediment for such process. And they would, you know, if you look at the evolution of the conflict, how you know that process has gone with that kind of outside support, which has made it quasi impossible, you know, to resolve the problem because the player, the main player that is defended by the big powers, you know, feel that it can do whatever it pleases and will go unpunished. You know that basically, you know, some people played. Uh, you know, they, they, they counted the number of times uh, that the United States, you know, uh, uh, vetoed resolutions, uh, you know, that were contrary to Israel. And the U.S. was basically uh, the only one, uh, you know, voting uh, against that resolution. Uh, you know. so, uh, so it's the same, you apply the same uh, to, to France vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Western Sahara. I'm not saying that the U.S. is not uh, also supportive of, of Morocco. It is. But uh, not to the extent that France is, and that I try to explain why. So, 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 but basically, there are three key players in this, uh, you know, the, 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 the prevention from the resolution, or you know, what some call uh, the irresolution of the Western Sahara conflict, is that basically uh, Morocco uh, can rely on. Uh, three uh, act, I mean, two actors within the Net United Nations Security Council, that is France and the United States, and Spain, uh, the former colonial power, which, by the way, from a uh, legal point of view, is still the territory's uh, administrating uh, power. And so these are, I would say, these are the countries, the three countries that have prevented the resolution of the conflict. Some of you may ask later about, you know, the other members of the Security Council, and I would be more than happy uh, to answer as well. Um, so, so since the Green March of 1975, uh, you know, which, by the way, was encouraged 
and designed by Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, who was French president at the time. This is 1975, mind you. So since then, um, you know, the uh, France has been the greatest supporter of Morocco in its what they call uh, in its struggle for recuperation of the provinces of the south. This is what even the French in the French lexicon, this is what you will find. Although France does not uh, officially recognize, uh, you know, the sovereignty uh, of, uh, of Morocco over Western Sahara, uh, not even on its maps, but it's still, you know, uh, it's a sort of de facto uh, recognition of the, uh, uh, you know, of uh, sovereignty. And, and again, France has been behind uh, the uh, notion of, uh, of autonomy. So, so like the in the U.S. regarding Israel, France's political elites support Morocco's position on the Western Sahara. There is, you know, uh, again, you look from left to right or right to left. Uh, you know, there is there is support for 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 Morocco. Um, and, you know, that is uh, that is a fact. I would say even more later. Um, so. Stephen uh, Zunis, in his in his article on Israel uh, in pa pa Palestine, Israel in the United States, he gave a whole list uh, of um, of the reasons why there is such support. You know, going from either religious or or, or, or interests, geopolitical interests, and so on, uh, lobbies, etc. So, what is it about France? So, some of the reasons are there is a sentimental attachment that many Frenchmen have for Morocco. Uh, the French elites, for, for instance, the ones that were born in Morocco, there are quite a few of them who have been at the heights of, uh, of power in France. They, 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 have, uh, they, they have been very supportive and they serve as a lobby within the structures of the state, of the French state in support of uh, Morocco. And, and there's also something uh, that one has to keep in mind is the negative experience that the French had with the Algerians, you know, the Algerians having obtained their independence through a terrible war. And so that that remained. So so in a sense, uh, whoever is against Algeria uh, is is a friend of, of, of France, uh, in a sense. So so there is a whole network of uh, elites uh, you know, uh, with you know between the French and the Moroccan elites, and thus they have this this kind of lobby. Uh, if you look, uh, you know, I have asked many of my students to look, you know, to see what they can find from the French media uh, on, uh, on on Western Sahara, and there's very little. There's very little, very little writings that they can have, you know, that would or or, or just to mention Western Sahara. There's you know, once every three, four years, I can even mention uh, of the top of my head, you know, some of the articles that have been published on Western Sahara. Uh, they're, they're really very few. Uh, and as I said, there's this um, resentment towards the colonial experience in Algeria. Um, and so, so it's, it's a negative uh, image, just like in the US, you would have some racism towards uh, Arabs and Muslims uh, in general. Uh, for most of the French political leaders, um, Western Sahara is basically an integral part of the Kingdom of Morocco. So in their eyes, international law is irrelevant, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to Western Sahara. You, you will see the French there are at the forefront, for instance, of human rights and so on. But if you uh, interview officials at the United Nations or just the facts about why there is no um, inclusion of uh, the, the human rights clause in MINURSO, they will tell you it's France that opposed it. So, uh, you know, even when the United States tried to include it, uh, uh, it, it was almost vetoed, you know, the, the French threatened to have a veto. They, there's the mention of humanitarian, but not human uh, rights you know, of the Palestinians. Uh, of the Sahrawis, that's right, of the Palestinians, obviously. So, uh, so if you look also between the left and the right, they all have the same basic attitude towards the uh, the Western Sahara conflict. Um, it, the um, uh, again, the political class 
has never made uh, it's, I mean, has never made it a secret of its firm opposition to an independent Western Sahara. If you ask French officials why, well, they would allege that well, we don't want another uh, microstate. They, they, you know, the notion of microstate or failed state started also uh, all the way back from with Giscard d'Estaing, you know, in 1975, and there was, you know, he argued on ne veut pas d'un microetat or they say it's a you know failed state or it, but basically uh, to uh, understand you have to continue we don't want a weak state under the influence of algeria this is this is really the idea because that would be you know uh, at least in their eyes you know a threat to their ally uh, morocco so so this is this opposition uh, to self-determination uh, and the referendum is also understood as, you know, uh, because they, they, they no, uh, no doubt that it would be favorable to the Sahrawis. So, so they, the belief is that this would destabilize the Moroccan monarchy uh, in the region. And in terms of tactics or, you know, the, the Moroccans have pursued, you know, with, with the French uh, elites, they even reached out to Le Pen. And eventually, even Le Pen supported Morocco's proposal for autonomy in Western Sahara within the framework of, quote unquote, Morocco's national sovereignty. So, so the, 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 the Moroccans have been very astute on this, the monarchy, in enlisting even the services of former members of the National Front, uh, front uh, to defend the occupation of Western Sahara. You know, so it's like, you know, you would have Israel in the US supporting the far right, even if it's for tactical uh, reasons. So, so um, another one um, is that the, uh, the, the, the left in France has not basically challenged uh, France's policy in the Western Sahara. So whoever comes to power, whether it's the left or the right, you would have the same stance, uh, and including uh, Macron, who made a statement uh, in, uh, in in 2017, you know, to the same effect. So it's always the same. Um, so so the, there is continuous, you know, political and military support to the Moroccan monarchy, and also um, France tries to uh, sort of have a balance with the with with with, uh, with Algeria, but everybody uh, is aware that um, you know the heart is uh, in the in morocco rather than in algeria other reasons that i would like to share with you is that the french account for 25 percent of all foreign tourists who visit the kingdom making france the number one source of tourists to morocco that's uh, one there are thousands of french citizens who reside in morocco there, are, in 2014, there were 47,000. I didn't get the the more recent because of the changes and what's going on uh, internationally. But um, there are close to uh, there are at least 50,000 uh, Frenchmen living in Morocco, and there are hundreds of French companies operating in Morocco. 70%, um, nearly 70% of total. Foreign direct investment uh, in Morocco is from France. Um, and France is the second largest trading partner uh, of Morocco after Spain and the main investor. So, um, so basically, uh, there's another uh, absolutely. Uh, hello? Um, it's some, um, sorry, that was a call. For me. Um, one other thing that I, I did, and it is uh, maybe astonishing for some of you, uh, many uh, French and Moroccan diplomats, they often argue that the annexation of Western Sahara is a way for France to compensate for the alleged and equitable division of colonial territories. In other words, the French had given, when they drew uh, the, the maps, they were more favorable to Algeria than to Morocco. And so, so the, uh, the, the Moroccan officials would argue that uh, uh, France uh, has offered Algeria this big territory, and it's only fair uh, that now we should keep uh, Western Sahara. 
Uh, and this is not a joke, by the way. So um, another point is that Morocco remains France's uh, military uh, relay in Africa. If you listen to or you follow Macron's policy, Emmanuel Macron's policy in Africa, uh, he refers to it as one in tandem with, uh, with Morocco. Uh, he, by the way, when he came to office, uh, Morocco had just joined the, uh, uh, the African Union and um, rumors uh, have it that uh, it was the French that were encouraging uh, Morocco to join uh, the African Union and to influence it uh, from within. In fact, Morocco, um, um, Macron, you know, declared that Morocco is a friendly country and a strategic partner uh, for France. So as far as the position of France vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Morocco, it is what I would say, uh, the position that, um, you know, that uh, uh, in you know the United States has uh, for Israel and and France works. I mean it's it's the lobby within the multilateral uh, organizations, whether it's the European Union or the United Nations or ECOWA, you know the African, the Francophone Africa. This is where France, you know, plays uh, an important role in helping Morocco uh, get allies to the point where uh, recently uh, a few poor very poor uh, West African uh, states have opened consulates in the occupied uh, territory, they, you know, where there's absolutely none of their citizens, but it was quite symbolic. So let me conclude because I think I have talked for a long time. Um, so the similarity that I draw between US Israel and France Morocco is to highlight the consequences that such relations have uh, you know, uh, in the two conflicts. First, they tend to perpetuate the conflicts. Uh, they, since they uh, don't want those conflicts to be resolved, they uh, perpetuate uh, their existence. And then you have, you know, uh, if, if people uh, rise up, uh, if they uh, try to defend themselves, then they become, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the terrorists or what have you. Uh, I would argue that such uh, backing or, you know, turns the victims into offenders. And that is what has been happening. You know, it, 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 you, get the, you get the sense that the Palestinians or the Sahrawis are basically the bad guys. They are the ones, you know, who are the reasons for, for, for those conflicts. Um, the other one is the violations of human rights that, that, that go unpunished. Uh, you know, um, and then you have, of course, uh, refugees that have been in camps for, uh, if you take the, the case of Palestine, you know, the, the number of, um, of camps and the Western Sahara, the, the, the people uh, in uh, the Tindouf uh, area, you know, who some, the, the kids who were born 40 years ago are now, you know, uh, have not seen uh, any of the, uh, of this so-called uh, UN processes or, you know, uh, peace process and, uh, and the like. So, you know, so basically I would argue that both the US and France, they seek to conceal that the occupiers, you know, uh, are just that. In a sense, uh, I don't know if some of you are aware, uh, you know, this uh, famous uh, deal of the century, you know, one of the, uh, the uh, persons who were in charge of it, uh, David Friedman, uh, even went to the, you know, in the State Department, wanted to strike out the term uh, occupation from all the uh, human rights, uh, you know, documents that the U.S. publishes annually. So if you look at the, you know, this uh, deal of the century, uh, I would argue, uh, you know, is basically the equivalent uh, of the uh, autonomy that the French want to offer, uh, you know, uh, the Sahrawis. And that was my, uh, you know, basically my presentations, and I'll be happy to take any uh, questions or comments.